you know, we talk about topics that are the need of the hour, but the topic we have today is not just the need of the hour, but a plan for the future. Everything is digital. All of us have a digital footprint. Even me being here right now, all of you being present here, we are creating a digital footprint as we go along and as this is being broadcasted on all social media networks, right? Um, we are on the brink of making history with this new personal data protection bill, a document that is setting the precedence for all future bills on data protection and bills that are going to be made in India. Data protection, right to privacy is absolutely critical. And we are incredibly lucky to have this incredible panel here today. And I would like to begin this panel by asking our panelists for their opening comments on what is the, like, you know, what are we trying to achieve with India's data privacy laws. Can we begin with Mr. Amar Kumar, uh, Kumar Sundaram? Thank you so much, uh, Vasudha. Uh, first and foremost, I was uh, listening to Dr. Batra very, very keenly for the last session. And uh, it was so absorbing uh, that we did not mind that uh, the session uh, got started a little late. Uh, it was absolutely absorbing. And when I'm going to talk about the profiling of the data during this session, I'm definitely going to touch upon some of the aspects which were discussed uh, uh, in the last session. Uh, coming back to the importance of data privacy law, uh, there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, uh, nobody should uh, ever be in any kind of a doubt that we immediately need uh, a good, strong data privacy law. There is a considerable delay, uh, and therefore it is all the more necessary uh, especially in the digital world that we are in. Uh, the situation that we have been brought in uh, because of the pandemic situations, which has acted as a catalyst, uh, all the more necessary that we should quickly have uh, this new law implemented. Uh, the social intermediary rules, which came up uh, recently, uh, that also needs to be interposed with the data privacy law that is imminent. So overall, there is a great need and as uh, the speed is the key, uh, we immediately need a strong data privacy law. Thank you so much for your opening comments. Mr. Sajai Singh, would you like to follow up? Hi, uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I got disconnected. This is the challenge, I think, with technology. While we have technology, electricity may be something which is more important for all of us. So I'm speaking from Bangalore and I keep losing electricity and therefore my connection. So I'll try and, uh, before I lose it again, uh, try and give you my opening comments. So the, the point really here is that the evolution of civilization is inter intimately linked with the exchange of information and ideas. What does this mean? That the flow of data is really crucial. And if there is a flow of data, which is resulting in commerce, regulation is inevitable. And regulation, when data flows across borders, brings about jurisdictional conflict. Now, certain jurisdictions across the world, like the European Union, California, South Africa, they've uh, enacted law like the GDPR in the uh, European Union, the California uh, Consumer Protection Act, uh, Consumer Privacy Act, the Protection of uh, Personal Information Act in South Africa. But uh, India is taking longer to uh, bring about or uh, uh, have a comprehensive data protection law because there are varied interests or competing interests that are at play and that need to be balanced. I think with China br bringing about its law in, on 1st of November, um, it, things should speed up for India as well. And if, since we are talking about data, it's important to understand that the impact that data creates and such impact has led the government to segregate data into different types or different categories. There's personal data, the sensitive personal data, the critical uh, data, and there's non-personal data. And the law, the PDP, which is the Personal Data Protection Bill, we, I keep re I'll refer to it as the PDP, which is the law under in progress, is bringing, is trying to regulate, give protection and rights around each one of these types of data or these sets of data. And it has been, of course, uh, uh, influenced by what's happening globally. Um, I will talk about that later, about Schrems 2 and various other global developments and global laws, uh, but also our own constitutional jurisprudence where courts have read the right of 
privacy under the uh, as a fundamental right under the right of life granted under article 21 so what the government is struggling with or trying to address let's not say struggling trying to address is the concept of protecting personal data on the one hand and also unlocking the data economy on the other so it is it, it, it is a complex task that the government has in a developing nation. And I think what I would end my initial comments with, uh, what should help the government is Lee by Graves' basic tenants for, the, for a data protection framework, which are basically four. The first is that there should be a single statute that legislates a data protection so that it ensures clarity and coherence. The second, that there should be an independent enforcement body to oversee the implementation of this legislation. Third, that there should be a broad framework of laws to enable smooth adoption of modifications because you know technology does change, which is in line with the changing needs of technology and innovation. So you're not restricting one or the, by the other. And finally, that there should be an advisory body for an effective understanding and implementation of the laws, which helps the enforcement body. So these would be my sort of initial comments uh, back to you, and I'll let you take the discussion forward. Thank you so much. I think you have covered um, basics of all things that we need to definitely develve into more important and more serious discussions about. Um, now I would like to also ask for the opening comments from Pavan Dugal. Thank you. Today, we are living in transient times. And in these times, if there is one common thread that's joining all of us, it's data. Now we are all working towards a data economy where data is a new oil. So it's but natural to expect that this data should increasingly come under more focus by governments across the world. The European Union was the torch bearer by coming up with the general data protection regulation. And over the couple of years, it's become the gold standard as far as data protection is concerned globally. However, a lot of countries and states have begun to start getting massively inspired by GDPR and started coming up with their own distinctive uh, legislations and rules and regulations on data protection. Most of these are more customized, localized versions of the GDPR. And India comes into that particular category of nations who've chosen to substantially and heavily rely upon the GDPR for the purposes of crafting its own national approach on data protection. Well, I think as we go forward, you have to quickly start realizing that the internet and cyberspace that were existing prior to COVID-19 are now history. COVID-19 has become the single biggest catalyst as far as changes in cyberspace are concerned uh, ever since our living memory of this generation is going. On top of it, uh, we have actually begun to start seeing the emergence of the golden age of cybercrime with the coming of COVID-19. And in this uh, age, data becomes the new target. So last year, the world has lost more than $6 trillion thanks to the data breaches and cybersecurity breaches. And this year, the figure is expected to go to more than $8 trillion US dollars in terms of global losses concerning data. In a scenario like this, therefore, I think your approaches to data protection have to be not seeped in pre-COVID-19 mindsets, but have to be futuristic, keeping in mind the current scenario of the pandemic and the post-pandemic world. During this uh, time of the pandemic, I had an opportunity to author my latest book called New Cyber World Order Post-COVID-19. In that book, I've actually argued that while fear and panic have been our two constant uh, companions during COVID-19, by the time the world is victorious against the current and subsequent wave of COVID-19 infections, we will enter into a new cyber age where a new cyber world order will await us, where states will become very powerful, but more significantly, in the new cyber world order, the data will become the only currency that the world is likely to know, the effective currency that can be relied upon, that can be monetized, and that can be used for a variety of purposes. Therefore, regulating data in an enabling yet strict manner becomes the norm of the day. So when you read the latest report from and the prediction from Gartner, who says that by the next two, three years, 
about 60% of the entire countries across the world are likely to have some privacy and data protection related frameworks. They're not off the mark. Therefore, the need is that India needs to have a holistic approach. Let's not rely upon a PDP bill of 2019. That's relied upon a pre-COVID-19 GDPR. Uh, there have been a lot of learnings that we have undergone in the Indian context during COVID-19. Those have to be specifically incorporated under India's proposed data protection legislation. And given the mandate of the Supreme Court, in the case of Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India, where the right to privacy is a fundamental right, the elements and the interaction between data privacy and data protection have to be more appropriately addressed. Further, Intrinsically connected with this entire issue of regulation of uh, data protection is the issue of protection of Indian cyber sovereignty. Unfortunately, the PDP bill, which is uh, so much dependent on uh, the customization of the GDPR, has chosen to be completely silent on how the Indian cyber sovereign interests and Indian cyber sovereignty can be appropriately protected. Also, I think there's far more now conflicts that are beginning to emerge between the PDP bill and the IT Act. And now with the coming into force of the information technology rules, 2011 from 25th of February, the waters have got more muddied. So therefore, it will require more clarity of vision amongst policymakers on how they want to effectively deal with data protection. India is late in the game as far as the global players are concerned, but India has to realize that it's sitting on a humongous volume of data. And in case our regulation of the data frameworks is not adequate or sufficient, we as a nation are likely to suffer apart from our data industries being prejudicially impacted uh, for a long, long time. So therefore, all eyes will be on the government on how they would come up with more futuristic approaches on data protection, given the judgment of Justice Puttaswamy versus Union of India, and given the new ground realities that India is seeing. There's massive adoption of artificial intelligence coming in. Internet of Things have been adopted blindly by stakeholders in India without having ramifications of uh, data protection on the IoT. And now with the Internet of Behavior emerging, it's a different ballgame altogether. So I think we have to have a more holistic approach, but all eyes will be on the government on how they would want to proceed forward with this very crucial and important element, which to a large extent will determine how India's digital future is going to shape up in the coming times. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Dogal, for You're laying out the exact sorry situation we are in right now. Um, before moving forward, I would like to make one small announcement that if any one of our audience members have any questions, we will be open to questions towards the end, maybe after 1.20. So please do keep that in mind. If you have questions, you can write them down and we will be taking those. Um, please, um, Mr. Kumar, you had a comment. Yeah, so Vasudha, I was uh, hearing uh, Sazal and Mr. Google, and uh, the only thing which comes to my mind is uh, uh, geography has become history now, you know. They talk about cross-border, uh, they talk about cross-jurisdictional issues, and therefore, as I always say, geography has become history now. Pandemic has taught us that we need to uh, come out of this mindset. There are Data is a global phenomena. And therefore, challenges associated with data is not India-specific now. There will be certain specific things which will be particular to India. But overall, it's a global phenomena. The challenges are going to be global. And therefore, we all have to deal with it uh, as, a, as a global phenomena. So geography has become history. That's what I wanted to bring in. But over to you, Vasil. Thank you so much for that comment. Actually, um, I am glad that everyone mentioned the global aspects of this conversation because we are bringing out this bill. It is very new to India and we know that GDPR has already been in place for two years or so. And we have taken a lot of cues from the GDPR that's in place. So I'd actually like to ask our panelists, you know, what other cues, cues can we take from the last two years of this, um, bill, of this act in other countries being in place that we can now take into India's uh, protection bill into account in the future for this bill and for future bills? Anyone can answer. Could I begin by saying that uh, one of the key elements that must inform India's decision-making and policy-making on data protection regulation will have to do with the data localization, primarily because India is becoming a powerhouse and its data is what's going to actually be powering the Indian digital powerhouse. So in case if you are not able to harness the constructive energies of Indian data being generated, uh, we could potentially be missing the bus. We have to be mindful of the fact that currently India is undergoing a great revolution 
I call it the great Indian vomiting revolution, where Indians are vomiting data about their personal, professional, social lives without understanding the legal ramifications or the impact of the same on their digital present and future. So in this uh, vomiting revolution that we are seeing all across, the value of regulating data becomes more important. But today what's happening, a majority of Indian data is actually funneling out of India, going on to American servers so that it can be accessed by American agencies. And of course, it can be monetized uh, till kingdom time comes by these service providers. With the result, India and Indians are toiling for generating data, but ultimately the benefits and the cream of this data is actually being harnessed by these service providers. And therefore, there is a need for somewhere looking at uh, data localization as an effective methodology for protecting Indian sovereign interests vis-a-vis -vis data is concerned. Thankfully, the Reserve Bank of India has stuck up to its guns and thanks to its uh, doggedness, today Indians have to uh, be thankful because their banking data continues to be within the territorial boundaries of India. But in case if you are using the WhatsApps, the Facebooks and the signals of the world, then you have to quickly realize that all your data is going out. And a lot of times, Indians uh, being you know absolutely trusting in nature tend to trust and see whatever they see uh, or whatever they hear online. With the result, most of the Indians have very, uh, shall I say, uh, distinctive approaches on perspectives on encryption. They like to believe what they uh, hear on the internet or on social media, that X platform is 100% uh, end-to-end uh, -end encrypted. It's time that Indians need to wake up, that not believe what you are seeing, that time has come where we need to put in an element of distrust and mistrust amongst ourselves so that before we rely upon any information that we see online, we must do our own independent verification of the same regarding its authenticity. And I think India must uh, also revisit its watered down approach on data localization, which the PDP bill 2019 has come across. Just as Sri Krishna committee was still pretty much on the right track, but it actually had suggested a substantial level of uh, data localization. But now uh, with this new PDP bill coming in, which is effectively telling the companies of the world, hey guys, we're absolutely fine in India. If you take our data outside India, just give us a serving copy. That I think is not going to work because once the data of India goes outside India, it's outside your hands, it's outside your control. And it comes to uh, within the purview and exercise and the jurisdiction of not just different laws in different countries, but more significantly, it also gets accessed by different intelligence agencies. So before you know, a lot of Indians today potentially get mapped and tracked thanks to this information that they have been sending outside India. And somewhere down the line, a lot of governmental data is also flowing outside of India, which is potentially going to have a prejudicial impact upon the sovereignty, security and integrity of India. Regarding corporate sector, there's a lot of, uh, of fear psychosis that's beginning to start coming in. They are saying, look, PDP bill is coming in. There are huge level of compliances and therefore we'll have to put in more uh, expenses and budgets. I think that's now given ground reality that we see online. The quicker we start realizing that we are going to invest more on data protection and on cybersecurity, the better it will be. And also the PDP bill needs to do far more in terms of addressing uh, distinctive issues on the intersection of data protection and the cybersecurity. This is all the more relevant since India does not have a dedicated data, uh, dedicated cybersecurity law like a lot of other countries have. And in the absence of uh, this law, and given the fact that the national cybersecurity policy of 2013 has just become a mere paper tiger, it's time that we need to see uh, data protection in more holistic terms and its uh, interactivity in various uh, verticals and uh, horizontals of uh, human activity. All said and done, uh, these are some of the elements that need to be taken into consideration. And specifically, there's a lot of confusion and overlap between the roles of intermediaries as defined under Section 21W of the Information Technology Act 2000 and the role of data repositories under the, uh, uh, the PDP bill. So I think there will be a lot of harmonization that will be required. Our uh, approaches need to be more crystal clear. The report of the Joint Parliamentary Committee is awaited. But whatever that report comes in, uh, I think the government needs to be more holistic in its uh, discussions and inclusive in its uh, deliberations before it moves forward. Thanks. So, Basuda, I will just uh, step in and uh, talk, uh, give two points to your question on how India can learn uh, from what's happened globally. And my 
comments will uh, rest on two global developments. One is the Schrems II judgment, uh, um, which uh, was um, in the EU. And uh, the second is uh, the Cam Cambridge Analytica, uh, uh, so to say, fiasco, uh, which happened in the US. So let's just start with the first. Uh, it, it is today, as it's already been established, it's a day and age of information and data. And it's inevitable that we need to have a law which is robust, of course, uh, uh, in today's context, but also timeless. And uh, what is very critical, uh, really, from um, this, the concept of commerce or, or to encourage commerce is that it allows seamless transfer of data from India overseas and from overseas to India, because that's how the data economy works. The transfer of data needs to be seamless or needs to have, um, needs to not have restrictions in most part. Of course, there, there are certain types of data that may have restrictions. And when we have data flows from say the EU and the UK and even the US, uh, those data need, to, that data flow needs to be facilitated if we are going to get business from those uh, jurisdictions. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost connection with Mr. Singh. But, you know, there are some really important points that came up here, especially regarding data. And we've seen uh, so many data breaches over the last few years, you know, from LinkedIn, Facebook, of course, big scandals all across the world. Um, I would like to ask, like, hone in on one topic, though. You know, there is a big concern about data profiling. Um, Mr. Kumar, could you tell us more about the challenges with data profiling and about these information leaking out of the country or even out of a company or a person's individual, you know, framework? please yeah so uh, Vasudha, the uh, definitely there is a concern uh, uh, on the flow of the data uh, moving out of the country and uh, while pdp bill does address a uh, lot of these concerns but are they good enough we don't know as we move forward we'll get to know more about it uh, but in this connection, you know, uh, a very important judgment that came up from Kerala High Court, which was the sprinkler judgment, and uh, it came up uh, somewhere around uh, 24th of April 2020. And uh, this was a case where uh, there was a lot of export of the COVID-19 related data by the state of Kerala, uh, which was moving to a US-based entity sprinkler for data analytics. And Sprinkler had its server outside of India. Uh, now, what was happening is that the state was collecting the data of the individuals who had tested positive or who had suspected to be COVID positive. And then the state was uploading it on the Sprinkler servers. Now, Sprinkler used to analyze the data and give it back to the state of Kerala, the analyzed data for their handling of the pandemic. So that was the entire scheme of the things. Now, a lot of concerns were being raised when these data were being transferred outside the country. And uh, it was it was raised whether that is in line with uh, the existing law and whether that is appropriate. The good part is that state of Kerala High Court was conscious of it. And they said that there are certain measures which needs to be implemented by the state of Kerala before granting Sprinkler the access to these data. Right? And then they talked about anonymization of the data, uh, obtaining a specific consent from the individuals, and then uh, ensuring that these data are returned back once the contractual obligations are made. Uh, there was a concern raised on the monetization of these data. So, so High Court of Kerala clearly barred advertisement and commercial exploitation of the data. The point I wanted to drive home is that while the there is an awareness among all of us, there is an awareness among corporate, there is an equal level of awareness which is now stepping in, in the judiciary. And therefore, judiciary, the Puttuswami case has really uh, led the foundation and there are a lot of high courts who have become conscious of this. Uh, coming back to the core point of profiling. Uh, profiling is an inevitable thing. Profiling is going to happen. There's so much of data which are coming in. Uh, profiling really helps in uh, picking out the information which are embedded in these data and profiling are really useful. A lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of machine learnings are being used when we are doing data profiling. Now, data profiling is just one aspect. 
one has to be conscious of the risks which are associated with data profile right and these risks are something which corporates should be conscious of uh, and the paramount importance is the consent of the individuals when you are profiling this data that that goes at the bottom of the entire profiling of the data uh, we just saw how uh, uh, in uk there was a national controversies in uh, august 2020 when the use of this data uh, by artificial intelligence and they had created an algorithm where the examination department was changed uh, the lot of students who had to appear for a level examinations for their potential entry into the uh, different universities of the world and uh, earlier it was done offline because of the pandemic the uk government decided that let's do it offline and they used uh, algorithms they used artificial intelligence and when the result came uh, there was a lot of national hue and cry and a lot of people and a lot of students uh, could not get chance to get an entry into many of these universities now bbc came out with a report and bbc said that even one students who was 18 years old students who had written a story on how these algorithms has its own biases that student was not selected what came out was that many of these selections were based on discrimination on economic interest some of the students who were studying in a, a rich and high level uh, educational institution they got selected some of the students who were in a low category schools or or educational institutions they were left out the point was that these data profiling uh, when you use machines when you use uh, ai there is a risk associated with it and therefore if it is not properly used it might lead to biases and therefore the objective which you want to achieve may actually get defeated so profiling of data is inevitable in today's uh, time it definitely helps Uh, but one has to ensure that these profiling of data does not lead to uh, discrimination in any form and that is where uh, the ethnicity the so raci racial discrimination uh, the sexual disorientation all these aspects needs to be looked into before you do profiling and the consent of the individual is paramount which must always be there yeah sorry i got disconnected sorry for the electricity problems and my connection problems but i i don't know if you asked a question in the middle but i think i will complete my earlier response by taking up from what amar just said about profiling and if that was the question that was the second part of my response on the global developments that india needs to take into account which was the cambridge analytica uh, issue that had uh, occurred where data subjects realized that they had little or no knowledge that their activity on facebook would be shared with third parties for targeted ad advertising uh, this was around the us elections and the data gathering practices were so opaque and still are very opaque and uh, the uh, complex privacy forms that users had really no control over and the you know like uh, it had been pointed out earlier nobody really bothers reading the fine print so the uh, the whole inadequate information on data flow and the whole art artificial intelligence tools which amar just mentioned they often worsen the relationship between the data subject and the collector and that ends up uh, like has been demonstrated in the cambridge Ana uh, analytica situation um, in in a in in a in what is called information asymmetry and that's really a problem that need really needs to be dealt with also the state uh, or the governments on the other hand which was also something that was mentioned do end up having because of their their, their coercive powers uh, and you know broadly they are unregulated in most countries they do collect and process a lot of personal data and this ends up being a huge repository of data for theft data for misuse and uh, Uh, you know if profiling is done for the right reasons that's fine but uh, again profiling without the consent of the individual may be a challenge and that all of these issues uh, learning from what has happened uh, globally 
um, need to be addressed. I think the PDP is addressing them. It is giving rights uh, to the data principle in terms of right of access, correction, deletion, and updating of respective data, and obviously the whole concept of consent. So that is something that is happening. Uh, let's see what the final bill says. The other point that I was making when I got disconnected uh, was with regard to the Schrems 2 judgment, which is what I was trying to explain was the cross uh, border data flow is very important. And what happened with the Court of Justice order uh, in, in Schrems 2 was that it invalidated a protective shield for transfer of data between the EU and the US and the sacredness of what were called under GDPR, the standard contractual clauses. And why did it say that? Because theoretically, if data moved under the EU-US privacy shield from the EU to the US, it was protected. And the GDPR uh, uh, subject was getting the same protection as it was getting in GDPR in the US. But what this judgment brought about was the surveillance power of the US government. And if the US government has a surveillance power to access that data, then the privacy shield is ineffective because the data subject in the EU doesn't have the same data protection in the US. So for India, it is very important that it gives the assurance to EU and of course other nations that it is going to give the same protection to the data of its citizens and the same protection will be given as it gives to its citizens to the citizens or the data belonging to citizens of another jurisdiction. And that is something that uh, the PDP bill, uh, it, you know, as it's probably will be revised, should take note from developments that have happened overseas. All right. Thank you so much. You know, there are several important parts here. First of all, you all mentioned um, consent because there is this aspect where we give consent to share our information with social media or whatever sites, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook. But once you remove yourself from that, there's no way of getting your information back. Once your information is this consent in, but there's no opting out of, you know, your information that's already been stored on these network sites. The other point that uh, Mr. Kumar actually brought up was biases. You know, we a lot of times when we talk about um, the online, the digital era, the digital platform, we seem to think of it as something that's very almost metaphysical, but it's not. There's people behind this and whoever are creating the, co the coding, like whatever our biases are, will be reflected in the codes that we create and the framework that we create that's ultimately put online. And of course, crime. Crime is a very important um, discussion that we need to have. There have been so many data breakages, uh, leeches, uh, sorry, <laughs> so many breaches of data um, that we've seen across you know, the past few years abroad and in India, but there's no really way to perhaps go after it. You know, we'd say that technology is ahead of the law and we cannot keep on functioning that way, absolutely not. Um, so I, I would like to ask um, our advocates here that, you know, what are the primary steps that a person can take when a data breach occurs? As an individual citizen or maybe even as a company, what can we do? There are a number of steps that can be taken by uh, stakeholders in the event of a data breach. A lot of people believe that India still does not have a data breach law in place. But when you look at the notification of uh, the Computer Emergency Response Team of India dated 4th of January 2017, uh, read that and you read that with Rule 3, of the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Storage Ethics Rules 2021, which have come into effect from 25th of February 21, there's no denying the fact that there are now legal frameworks in place for reporting cybersecurity breaches. First and foremost, once you become a victim of a cybersecurity breach, you have to identify who are you. Are you a company? Are you an intermediary? Are you an individual? Or are you an organization? Now, even whether you are a company, you are an organization, you have to ask yourself, are you an intermediary? Uh, are you following under the parameters of Section 21W of the Information Technology Act 2000? Because today, uh, a majority of companies in India qualify as intermediaries because they are dealing, handling, or processing third-party data and are providing services with respect to third-party data. That being so, there is a mandatory obligation to report a cybersecurity breach. It should be done on as soon as possible basis. Uh, any kind of a delay is something that's uh, not going to augur well. 
If you choose not to report a cybersecurity breach, please remember it's a cyber crime under the Information Technology Act 2000, gets you two years jail time as also fine. Further, you have to understand that in case if you are an individual and you uh, you become a victim of a cybersecurity breach, you also have both the options. You need to report the said cybersecurity breach to the Indian Nodal Agency on Cybersecurity, being the Computer Emergency Response Team of India. In addition, a breach of a cybersecurity also tantamounts to a cybercrime. So you are mandated to also report the cybercrime uh, to the National Cybercrime Reporting Portal, which is at cybercrime.gov.in. Alternatively, there's a helpline number one double five two six zero. You can utilize the self help the self uh, the helpline lum- number for the purposes of reporting the said cybersecurity breaches. Now, the chances are that you can still think that look, I'm invisible and that nobody will come to know about my cybersecurity breaches and that let the status quo continue. Because a lot of organizations and companies believe that if you report a cybersecurity breach, you will be perceived to be not so secure and that could have a prejudicial impact upon your share uh, values and also upon your perception in the minds of existing and potential business prospects. Now you have to quickly start realizing that you do no longer have just a choice. It's uh, something that's mandated under law And the quicker you do so, it's better. Because in case if it's tomorrow found out that you have not reported a cybersecurity breaches, then remember a debacle sword is going to be hanging on your head for the next seven years because that's a time frame under which anyone can go and complain against you. And then you would be required to show cause and to say why you did not uh, go ahead and report such cybersecurity breaches. Also, when you choose not to report a cybersecurity breach, you yourself commit various offenses under the Information Technology Act 2000, as also under the Indian Penal Code. So I think let's begin by basic understanding that nobody is secure. Let's understand that we we will all, as companies, try to put in reasonable security practices and procedures. We will put in our ISO 27001. But despite that, our cybersecurity is going to be breached. So in case if it's going to be breached, let's try to adopt and usher in the age of cyber resilience where we take it for granted that we will be breached, but how quickly can we come back to a state of normalcy after getting breached is something is what cyber resilience will be all about. And that will require a change of mindset. It will require a change of legal frameworks. And of course, it will also require more effective enforcement of existing legal frameworks as well as the cybersecurity breaches are concerned. Thanks. So I'll just add to that, Vasudha, in terms of the law part Pavan has covered, but Beyond that, it is also the uh, compliance with the uh, reasonable security practices and procedures that the company has adopted. So if a company has taken the ISO uh, uh, certification, then there are obligations under those certifications that it needs to comply with if there is a breach. Many companies today globally and in India are putting a process in place. They have a whole... uh, uh, you know, they have a CIO, CTO and various other people who work together to create these emergency response teams. And there is a whole process because now it is not that will it ever happen, but when will it happen, the the breach? And when the cyber breach happens, there is a whole procedure. So it's not that anyone is confused as to what has to be done. There is a reporting requirement to the government and the governments may not just be in India, they may be global uh, because the breaches could happen or affect uh, personal data of individuals globally. So you have to go to each jurisdiction and find out what the reporting requirements are. And each jurisdiction, unlike in India, where you can do it within reasonable time, prescribes a time frame. So from the date or time you got knowledge, you may have 72 hours, 36 hours, whatever to report. In addition to that, you would have the internal compliance, which says beyond the reasonable security practices that you adopted, which says that you need to inform the data subjects, because sometimes where it's financial data that's leaked, where a password has been leaked relating to, say, a a credit card or a bank account, then the person has to be informed to withdraw or um, uh, change the password or withdraw the credit card so that they can take steps. The person who's been affected can take steps. Uh, So it's very important to follow those internal processes as well, or the processes prescribed by the security practices that you have decided to adopt. And 
that internal compliance is something that companies are doing far greater and you know there's a whole process that has been set up uh, far more than just regulatory compliances or filing with the government authorities. Thank you, Mr. Singh. And I've seen that we actually have gone over time and I did mention that people could ask questions. So if anyone does have any pressing questions, we can take maybe one or maybe two. Uh, yeah, front row. <laughs> yes, please. And if you have someone in particular you want to ask to, please uh, do take their name. So this question is directed to Pavan sir. Sir, how can we balance the data security and the corporate interest? Like the, is the coming PDB bill going to uh, make the corporates escape, make, the, make them go away from India? Or how we can balance the corporate interest with the uh, public interest? Thank you for your uh, fantastic question. Uh, today, most of the corporates are very wary that the PDP bill where Bill is going to bring in a new era of more compliances, more rigorous exposure. Somewhere down the line, uh, there has to be a citizen-friendly, a user-friendly, a corporate-friendly approach as far as data protection is concerned. Uh, and that will be dependent on what kind of messaging is the government going to give, out, give to the new PDP bill once it receives the report from uh, the Joint Parliamentary Committee. But having said that, I think uh, the positives of data protection needs to be specifically highlighted. As a nation, we haven't done much in terms of giving the right messages to the corporate sectors. Uh, we've already been seen to be appearing as uh, you know, a strong government who is ready to come and uh, regulate. What we really need to give a message is that data protection is ultimately essential for perpetuating and growing the businesses of corporates. Uh, because if you're going to put in appropriate uh, security practices and procedures, if you comply with law and you are protecting the data of your customers and third parties and vendors, then your own cybersecurity is going to be at a relatively high level. And that could potentially usher in more growth as far as your e-commerce operations, as far as your other business operations are concerned. And somewhere down the line, the governments uh, of the country need to specifically give a message to corporates, which unfortunately has got, got somewhere, you know, uh, buried into the ground. The message is, that if you do not uh, report a cybersecurity breach, then uh, you are not likely to get the benefit of the suraksha coverage that the law is providing you. And then you're going to be exposed to unlimited damages by way of compensation. And that's something that no corporate would really want to have. I think somewhere down the line, India needs to give a historical as also a philosophical color to the uh, message uh, as far as data protection is being given to uh, the corporates. You see, in Mahabharat, discourse, during the Gita discourse, we find uh, Lord Krishna gives one central message to Arjuna. Lord Krishna says, come to my sharan and I will protect you. The PDP bill, the Information Technology Act, our legislations that are going to specifically give and are giving the same message, come with inside my ambit and I will protect you. So if these companies and almost all of the corporates today, in fact, 99% of companies today become intermediaries under the IT Act, they need to be actually sensitized about the positive values of the Suraksha Kavaj that let them comply with these basic parameters of due diligence. And then the law is given them the solemn, pro the solemn promise that, look, thereafter, whatever happens, you cannot be sent to jail. You cannot be forced to pay one rupee damages by way of compensation. That kind of messaging needs to be going quickly. Uh, these kind of misinformation that's getting generated, that companies will have to wind up their operations in India because India is coming up with a very strong data protection law are all rumors, are all fake news that needs to be dispelled. Of course, unfortunately, India does not have a dedicated law on fake news, nor on cybersecurity. So India becomes a fertile ground for these kinds of misinformation campaigns. But I think the right messaging needs to go across. And even from the corporate angle, the more duly diligent you are, the more compliant you are, the more protected your data is, the higher the chances that there'll be lower legal exposure to legal consequences. Thanks. All right, thank you. I hope that answers your question. And I know there's one more question, um, and I would request the panelists who answers to please um, to do it in uh, quickly because we do not have a lot of time. We have already gone overboard. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm Utkash Kumar Saroj from Asian Law College and I want to ask one question, simple question that uh, if uh, many Indians uh, travel across the globe uh, yearly and uh, they s exchange their uh, cell phones or device uh, with a new one and uh, suppose uh, I format my cell phone or any device uh, and I uh, exchange it with new one, 
the phone is still carrying some uh, sensitive uh, data which can cause to national uh, security. Uh, the first initiative, uh, what uh, the, you all will be suggesting us to uh, stop this? Well, I can just uh, begin and then let, let others uh, answer. I can say, look, your, your phone is your most valuable device. Do not exchange it under any circumstances because even if you delete your data, it remains inside the phone. Unless until you are cocky smart enough to format your phone seven times, after which data does not uh, get available, the chances are that your data is going to be ultimately found by data merchants, by corporates. So let's not go for this small, uh, you know, uh, what I call the Indian lalach. I believe that let's uh, not be uh, swayed away by the free lunch syndrome. Let's remind ourselves that whenever something is being given to you for free or in exchange, you are the product, your data becomes more crucial. Therefore, it's better that you discard your phone physically, break it with a foil, with a stone or a hammer, and then throw it away rather than exchanging it because your data is something, if it's going to be misused tomorrow, it's going to come back and haunt you and you don't exactly know how it's going to be potentially be using against you. Over to the other panelists. I think um, you did more or less answer that question. And right now, until the laws and these bills come into effect, um, the onus will be on the individual, what it sounds to me like, to protect your um, data as much as possible. Uh, I'm sorry, we do are, have a constraint for time. So I would like to ask our panelists to do their closing comments, maybe under 30 seconds if possible. Um, just your last finalized comments to close this panel. Um, Mr. Kumar, we haven't heard from you in a while. Please, would you like to go first? Thank you so much, uh, Masuda. Uh, so uh, a quick thought that comes to my mind is uh, one is definitely an internal to a corporate and every corporate should now start investing more on data management right and uh, uh, it's it's so essential that data is at the core of their business and therefore they should start uh, uh, investing more in terms of processes protocols and having right set of people within their data management team uh, the second and the larger and a bigger issue is uh, is we need to have a comprehensive legislation around data so just like an IBC, which is a code, it is not called an act. Similarly, we should also think in terms of having a comprehensive legislation around various aspects of uh, data related laws, be it uh, e-commerce, be it social intermediaries, be it information technology, be it cybersecurity, a good comprehensive law is needed in India. Uh, third, most important, DPO, good part is that DPO has been given a legal recognition under certain circumstances in the PDP bill. It will be wise if we give DPO uh, statutory recognition also under the Companies Act so that the DPO becomes an important person in any kind of a corporate scenario. So those are three my closing comments that I have. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Closing comments um, under 30 seconds, if possible. Sure, under 30 seconds it will be. Well, India's pri privacy regulation is key to ensure an orderly digital market, which presents a win-win situation for both, uh, for all three actually, for its citizens, the state and commercial enterprise. So this is very important from the question that was asked as well. This is playing on everyone's mind and the data privacy regulation needs to address all these three stakeholders, the citizens, the state and commercial en enterprise. And to conclude, I would say that the PDP bill should fulfill the need to for protecting privacy as a matter of fundamental right of you know, its citizens and demonstrating preparedness to meet the widely accepted standards of data protection in the international community, because we have to demonstrate that we will also protect the rights of citizens of other jurisdictions, the uh, right to privacy uh, of the data, and we will allow a seamless flow of data to facilitate commerce between jurisdictions. So thank you. Those were my last comments. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Your electricity is free to go haywire now from our end, at least. <laughs> Mr. Dukal, your final comments. I can just say we have entered into the data age. Data is the new live ammunition that's lying all around us. Let's learn to respect data for its intrinsic value. Let's, uh, as corporates, begin to start 
realizing during COVID-19 that uh, cyber law will now be an integral part of your daily activities. And there will be three guiding uh, sisters for you in the terms of the coming times. These are cyber crimes, cyber security breaches, and data protection and privacy. Those will be important first area that any corporate will have to be consciously careful about as it goes across planning and implementing its data strategies in the coming times. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for part, uh, for listening to this panel and participating. If you do have any questions and you are logged into our um, online framework, you can ask it in the chat section or in the Q&A section, and maybe some of our panelists can answer those questions for you online itself. Uh, thank you, panelists, for joining us today, and I hope you have a great day ahead of you. And it's thank a you. shame that you weren't here with us, but we make do with what we have. Thank you.